Hello. Well, it is still October, so uh, still month of Halloween, so I thought I'd do another uh, spooky, you know, game. So another zombie game. I did Walking Dead uh, a couple weeks ago. Thought I would do Dead of Winter. That's one game I haven't do, done a video on, and it is a Halloween-y themed kind of game. So let's get started with setup. First thing you do is put the colony colony board in the center of the play area. Then you take the six location cards and place them around or near the colony board as best fits your table. So I just set mine up here above the colony board. You've got the police station, grocery store, school, library, hospital, and gas station. You then take the main objective cards. Uh, you can uh, the players can decide which objective they want to play. You can pick one randomly, or uh, the rules uh, suggest for your first play to play the we need more samples main objective. So that's what the one we will go with um, for this. And these main objective cards have an opposite side. That's the hardcore side, a little more difficult. Uh, they suggest to play that um, if you're playing the pure co-op method where there's like no betrayer um, or if you just want a harder game but we'll go with the uh, standard we need more samples and you place that on the main objective section of the colony board then you look at the setup section it says morale starts at six you use the blue uh, marker to uh, go on the morale track and we'll set that at six and it says the round track starts at six you use the red marker uh, for the round track and if I can get it on there we'll place that at six on the round track of the colony board it also says add one zombie to all non-colony locations so that's these locations up here these are the spaces for zombies these are the entrance spaces so we'll place one zombie on each of these so we'll place one there these are the zombie uh, standees and their various but we place one on each of the non-colony locations like so and that's all there is for setup in this so we need more samples objective give each player a player reference sheet it just says player reference sheet on the back I'm setting up for three players so I'll set out uh, three player reference sheets they just have round summary and what actions you can do in your turn then there's also a space for your dice and your leader and followers which we'll get to here sh shortly next you take your secret objective deck uh, remove all of the secret objectives that say betrayal on them so you only have uh, secret objectives that are non betrayal cards so here's the betrayal secret objectives and the non betrayal they both have the same back you'll shuffle the non betrayal secret objective deck then you'll set aside two per player so with a three player game that will be a total of six Then you just return the rest of these to the game box. You then take your Betrayal Secret Objective cards, shuffle those up. Then add one of those to your uh, set aside um, non-betrayal cards. Just return the rest of your Betrayal cards uh, to the box. You'll then shuffle up your Secret Objective cards and deal one to each player. And then uh, those players will keep their secret objective uh, face down in secret from the other players. So we'll deal one to player one, one to player two, one to player three. The uh, ones you do not deal out to a player go uh, back to the box without being looked at. So normally you would keep your secret objective, as I mentioned, secret only to you since I'm playing solo as three players. I'm going to go, go ahead and turn mine over. 
them just so I see what they are. Um, but we did not get a betrayer. Um, it's possible, you know, we dealt one uh, into the secret objective cards. So it's possible we could have had one betrayer who would be um, working against uh, the rest of the colony. But we did not get that. So these each give you a way that you can uh, win the game. So, for instance, this one, this player, they win the game if the main objective has been completed, which, remember, that's up here on our main objective card. We didn't really look at that, but for a victory, every time the zombie is killed, you roll a die. If the die result is four or higher, add a zombie token to this objective. Accumulate three zombies on this main objective for each player that started the game. So for us, that would be a total of nine. And uh, if you do that, then you've reached the main objective. So this player's secret objective is um, um, the main objective is been completed and then have at least two um, item cards that are a weapon uh, equipped um, to survivors they controlled. So you see that even if as a group you reach the main objective, you complete the main objective, only the players that complete their secret objective actually win the game. So this player the main objective has been completed and a survivor you control must have at least two wound tokens of any type on them. And this player, um, the main objective has been completed and you have the most survivors in your following. So you can only win the game if you meet your um, secret objective. Now it can be more that, that more than one player wins the game and it may be that no players win the game. It just depends on if uh, a player is able to meet their secret objective. But let's finish with setup. Next you take your crisis cards, shuffle those up and place them on your crisis card space on the colony board. Alright, so I've shuffled those, place them on the colony board. Next you'll shuffle, shuffle your survivor deck. And you just place that with somewhere within easy reach of all players. You shuffle your exiled objective cards and place them within reach of all players. Shuffle your crossroads cards and again place them somewhere near the board where all players can reach them. Next you'll shuffle all your sta starter item cards. You'll see this is your item cards that they all say starter at the bottom. So you shuffle those up and deal five to each player. After you've dealt five to each player, you just return all the other uh, starter item cards to the bot. And so I've dealt uh, five starter items to each player. You'll separate the remaining item cards into decks uh, according to their location. These are like these are all school, these are all grocery store, these are all police station, gas station, hospital. And library, you'll shuffle those decks individually and put them on the locations in this space that they go with. So the gas station cards would go here, hospital cards will go here, etc. So let me get those shuffled up and place them. All right, so as you can see, I've got each of those decks shuffled up and placed on the location that corresponds to the individual deck. Next, you take your survivor deck and deal four survivor cards to each player. Players will then look at their uh, survivors that were dealt to them. They'll choose two to keep and return the rest to the survivor deck. So, for instance, this player may choose Ashley Ross and Olivia Brown and return Mike and Bev to the survivor deck. So each player will do that. After each player has chosen their two survivors and returned the others to the survivor deck, you then reshuffle the survivor deck. Each player will then choose to make one of their players their group leader and put them to the left of their reference sheet where it says group leader. The other uh, survivor that they choose will go down here under their reference sheet where it says followers. The players then find the corresponding standees for the survivors that they chose and place those 
over here in the colony board where it says colony occupants. So for three players, we've got six uh, survivors. You then just place the remaining standees and tokens uh, somewhere near the board, however you wish. I put mine in these little token holders. Um, but anyway, you just put all your tokens and remaining standees near the board. You then look at the influence value, which is this top circle number of all the survivors that were chosen by the players and the uh, survivor with the highest influence value which is Brian Lee uh, that player will receive the start player token put that in his play area and we are um, almost finished with setup in fact we are finished with setup so it should, should look uh, something like this and now we'll uh, start with how you play the game all right so how do you play the game well we can look at this reference sheet and see that there's two phases the player turns phase and the colony phase so the first thing you do in the player turns phase at the beginning of the round is reveal a crisis card and that crisis card will show um, some event that's going to happen at the end of the round if this crisis is not prevented so you'll see it shows an icon which means medicine um, equals number of non-exiled players so we'll talk about what exiled players are later but um, players will have to contribute items um, from their hand that have the medicine icon on them uh, let me find one uh, such as this one you'll see it has the medicine symbol there so in order to prevent this crisis from happening players will have to contribute uh, cards to the crisis which will go here they'll contribute them face down because if you have a betrayer they may uh, put a card in there that doesn't really uh, match that symbol and that will be detrimental to um, preventing this crisis we'll talk about that more again a little bit later but again the crisis can be averted if players contribute a number of medicine items equal to the number of non-exiled players which currently at the start of the game is three so there would have to be at least three medicine cards uh, in there if at the end of the round when you get to the um, uh, colony phase you'll do a resolve crisis step and if there are not um, if you haven't um, got the number of items that you need, you do this fail step, which here would place one wound token on all non-exiled survivors, and the colony would lose one morale. And if you put, uh, if the survivors actually put more than the needed amount, so up to five here, um, then you would actually gain a morale and this effect does not happen so anyway at the beginning of the round you'll reveal a new crisis card and that will be the current crisis for the round then you see we go to the roll action dice so during this step players will remove if they have any unused or used action dice currently on the reference sheet they'll remove those then they get one dice plus one dice for each survivor that they control so at the beginning of the game um, each survivor would then or each player would have three dice so you get one dice plus one for each survivor you the control that you control so that's a total of three for each player each player will roll those and then that then they put those on their unused action dice sheet so I've done that for each player here. Now, if you, as the game goes on, you will likely get more survivors you control. And at the beginning of the round, you would then um, have more action dice than just three. Um, you may lose some. You, 
maybe you only have one survivor you control, in which case you would only have two action dice, because again, it's one dice plus one for each survivor you control. Anyway, then each player rolls them as I've done here and put them on their unused action dice location on their reference sheet. And that is the roll action dice step. Then we go to player turns, starting with the first player, which is the player that has the first player token. They'll take all the actions they want or can take. And once they're complete, then it passes to the player to their left. That player will take all the uh, actions that they want to or can do. And it passes again to the player to their left. Once the last player has taken their turn, that will end the player turns phase and we'll go to the colony phase. But let's talk about the different actions that a player can take on their turn. So this player is the first. Now actually the first thing that happens at the beginning of a player's turn is the player to their right will draw a crossroads card. And they will look at it. Remember this is the player to the right of the player who's actually taking their turn. But before they actually take their turn they'll draw this crossroad card and they'll look at what's in it, italics here. If the player controls Bev, well, this player does not control Bev, but if at some point during their turn they happen to control Bev, um, then this could still trigger. Um, right now it does not trigger. If, it, if they did, then this would trigger immediately and they would read this text and read the player these two options and the player would have to make the choice of one of these two options. Since it, it doesn't trigger right now since the player does not control Bev, they don't tell the player whose turn it is what this card is. They just keep it and if at any point during their turn they meet the trigger condition, then they read the text aloud to that player and give them the option. So right now this player here would just hold this crossroads card and keep it in their play area and again they'll watch um, this player what they're doing on their turn and if they ever meet the trigger criteria which would be if the player controls Bev so they would have to find the survivor Bev um, somehow and uh, and then control them and if that happened that would trigger this and they would read it and give them the options but again so uh, that didn't trigger right now so this player can go on with their turns so one action you can do is, a, is attack. Let's look at actions that require an action dice. So attack a zombie or survivor. So we'll, we'll see. We'll, we've, I've placed Brian Lee like he's up here at the school. And he's got one zombie that's there in his location. So if he wants to attack that zombie, we look at his card. And he has to have a dice with at least a, a value of three or higher. So he does have two, so he could spend one of those dice, put it over here in the used action dice, and then attack that zombie. In this case, when you attack a zombie, you simply remove it from the board. It's automatically killed, but then you have to roll for exposure with this dice. So anytime you attack uh, a zombie, you have to roll for exposure. So you roll this dice, see your result a blank so nothing happens. If you get a blank that's good. If you get an icon like this that's a wound you then have to get uh, a wound token and put it on your character. If you ever um, get three or more wound tokens then your survivor is killed. So that's it. It's pretty simple for attacking a zombie. If you make an attack against it, then you're just automatically successful and kill it. And, of course, you do have to roll the exposure dice, which may or may not give you a wound. If you roll this icon, then that's a frostbite. Um, so you would take, instead of a wound, you would take a frostbite token, or which is the flip side of the wound token, and put that on your character. And the bad thing about a frostbite is that counts as a wound, and at the beginning of every one of your turn, or of a player's turn, every one of their survivors that has a frostbite token receives an additional an additional wound um, on that survivor. So when you get these frostbite uh, wound tokens, 
you'll want to try to heal those. And there's ways to do that uh, with medicine item cards or um, with the doctor. Uh, for instance, Olivia here, she has a power. Once per round, you may remove any type of wound token from a survivor that shares a location with Olivia. And Olivia may use this ability on herself. So there are ways to get rid of these wound tokens. The other thing you could roll, there's only one of them on the exposure dice, but it's a uh, bitten uh, icon. And that is not good. If you get bitten, your survivor is immediately killed, and then the bitten effect can spread. And it spreads uh, to other survivors that share a location with the survivor that was bitten. So uh, if there are multiple, multiple survivors that share a location with the survivor that was bitten, then the survivor that has the lowest uh, influence, influence value, which remember is that top circled number, they would be the one that the infection spreads to. And then the person that the infection spreads to has a couple of choices. They can immediately just kill the survivor that the uh, bitten effect spread to and then that will stop the spread of the infection or they can try to roll the exposure dice again and on a result of a blank which that is the majority of the uh, results are blank um, if it is a blank then the infection will stop spreading if it's any other result then that survivor is killed and the infection spreads again to the next uh, survivor in that location that has the lowest influence value. And so it will keep going until either somebody chooses to kill the survivor that uh, the infection spread to or they manage to roll a blank and then the infection will stop spreading. Or if there's just no more survivors in that location, then the infection the uh, um, infection will immediately stop spreading also. All right, so let's get back to our action. So we were talking about an attack action. I showed uh, if you attack a zombie, um, as long as you spend an action dice equal to your attack value, um, you then just kill the zombie and then roll for exposure. You can also attack another survivor that's in your location. So if, for instance, for some reason, the player that controls Brian Lee here wanted to attack uh, Janet Taylor here, he would actually, of course, he would have to spend a die equal to his attack value or higher to do that. Then he would roll that dice, and if the result he rolls is equal to or less than the attack value of the player he's attacking, Jan Janet Taylor in this case, then he successfully attacks and places a wound token uh, on Janet Taylor, and then he gets to uh, draw a card, um, an item card from the hand, a random item card from the hand of the player that controls that survivor. And a player can make multiple, take multiple attack actions with the same survivor as long as they have dice to spend. So, you know, he could have Brian this, spend this one that's three plus or higher to make an attack a a action against a zombie or survivor in his location. If there were uh, more zombies or survivors that he wanted to attack, he could spend another dice and have that same survivor attack again. As long as he can spend one. Now here, he wouldn't be able to because... He needs to have a dice value of three or higher, and he's only got a two left. And I don't think I mentioned this, but if you're attacking another survivor, you don't roll for exposure. That's only when you're attacking a zombie. All right, let's talk about another action you can do that does require a die, and that's a search action. All right, a player at one of the locations... Um, outside the colony, you cannot search at the colony, but a player at one of the other locations, or a survivor at one of the other locations, can search there by spending a die equal to their search value or higher. So a die here, if Brian Lee was doing that, of four or higher. So he could, you know, spend this dice. 
and then he could search and he draws the top card of the deck from the location he's at and he can then keep that card or he can decide if he doesn't like what it is he can decide to make noise by adding a noise token to the location in the noise spot and then he can draw an additional card and uh, if he doesn't like that he can make noise again you can continue to make noise until the location uh, all the noise spots at that location are full and then you uh, can't make any more noise so either once you decide that you are good with uh, one of the cards that you've drawn or you've made all the noise you can then you have to choose one of those items put it in your hand and the, all the remaining items um, then go to the bottom of the search deck and then you have to keep um, the item that's in your hand now this one um, actually is an event so you add the top card of the survivor deck to your following so that's how you would get another survivor you would draw the top survivor card um, there add that to your following so that would give you another survivor and place their ma matching standee in the colony and that add one helpless survivor token to the colony these are the helpless survivor tokens so you would uh, then add that to the colony um, but there's other items um, similar to, the, you know, that might be medicine or uh, different things. Kind of like your starting items here. You've got, uh, let's see what this person has. Junk, medicine, junk, food, medicine. So uh, there's different things in these different locations. And if you look at the top of these locations... You can look at the icons here, and from left to right are uh, the chance, um, the higher chance you're going to find an item matching that type. So that's food, education, tool, medicine, and survivors. So those are the likelihood of you're going to find that type of item at that location. So you can see the different locations. At the hospital, obviously, you're more likely to find medicine at the gas station you're obviously more likely to find fuel and again uh, a survivor could then search again by spending another action die and then again draw another card from the deck so if you you may instead of making noise because later on in the colony phase these noise uh, icons are going to add more zombies to the uh, are likely to add more zombies um, to the location, and we'll talk about that later. So instead of making more no, more noise to uh, draw another card or whatever, and you'll still only get to keep one, you can do one search action with one die, draw the top card to keep that, maybe make some noise to look at some more, but you only get to keep one. But then you can search again by using another dice, draw another card, or then add make noise you know up till of course you can only make noise until there's four there but then you'd get to keep another card so anyway you can search with the same survivor as many times as you have dice that allow you to do it that uh, again you have to have a value of the person searching um, the die value has to equal their search value or higher you know so for him it's four for Annalie Chan she only needs a die of uh, two or higher to search or attack. All right, the next action we see that requires the dice is a barricade. Now you can spend a dice of any value to place a barricade. You just spend the dice, put it in your used action dice, take a barricade token, and then you can place it on one of the entrance spaces at a location of the survivor that's taking that action. So he could place a barricade uh, here. If you were doing it at the, if a survivor that's at the colony was doing a barricade action, you know, they could place a barricade on one of the entrance, any one of these entrances on one of the entrance spots. And again, that's a die value of, of anything. You just have to spend one of your dies. All right, next is clean waste. That requires an action die. So first let's talk about as you spend item cards, you'll see like if you spent this one 
um, for its effect um, of remove any type of wound token from a survivor you control. If you, sp if you spend an item you have for its effect, you'll see it says waste pile. So it that card will go into the waste pile at the colony. So every time survivors or players um, uh, play item cards that say waste pile, that card will go into the waste pile. So in the colony phase, when you get to the colony phase, if you have uh, more than 10 cards in your waste pile, there's a bad effect or a detrimental effect, which we'll talk about later. But if you take the clean waste action, if a player has a survivor at the colony, they can take the clean waste action, which they can spend a die of any value. Again, they spend one of their die of any value, and they can remove the top three cards from the waste pile, and those cards just go out of the game. All right, and the last action here that you'll see that uh, requires a die is attract. So a player can um, spend a die of any value to move two zombies from one location to um, two empty entrance um, spaces at his location. So if Brian Lee here was going to do the attract action, he could spend a die of any value, and then he could maybe, since there's, if there's like three zombies here at the colony, he can do the attract. He can take two of those zombies from there and add them to empty location, empty, empty entrance locations or spaces at his location. And some survivors may have a ability, you'll see that survivors have abilities down there uh, at the bottom of their survivor card. Some of them may have an ability that um, requires an action dice and if it does it'll have uh, an icon kind of like this that you know three plus or whatever that you would have to spend a dice um, with a value equal to that or greater in order to activate that ability. If it doesn't have if, if your ability doesn't have something like that, then you can just do it. So like this one, once per round, you may increase an unused action dice you control by one. So that's uh, his ability. So the different survivors, we've looked at a couple of abilities. We looked at the doctors and Brian's, but some of them may require an action dice. And again, if it does, it will show a number uh, next to the ability um, that says you know what dice value you have to spend to use that they also some of them may say a location like this one says colony and hers is hospital meaning you can only use that power at that location all right so now let's look at some of the actions you can do that do not require uh, play a card again that's you can play a card a player can play a card from their hand that doesn't cost any dice and you can play as many cards from your hand as you want to to use the abilities they have we looked at this medicine lets you remove a wound token from a survivor you control um, if you play a food card uh, you can add one food token from the supply so like for this one you'd take one food token uh, put it in the food supply of the colony and then uh, th this card would go into the waste pile or you could play a junk card to re-roll an unused action dice um, you control. So you could, like if you had a 2 and that's low, you could spend a junk card into the waste pile and re-roll your 2. Um, so anyway, you can play uh, as many cards from your hand as you can or want to on your turn. You can add a card to the crisis, like we talked about, the current crisis requires a cards with the medicine symbol on there so you can add it from your hand as many um, cards one or more cards that have that may or may not have that symbol if you're a betrayer and, and you're kind of playing against the colony you may add a card um, that doesn't have the symbol to the crisis because again you play some face down so players don't know if you played one uh, that actually is go going to help the crisis or hinder the crisis but again you can add a card to the crisis and uh, some item cards that you may get um, like weapons or something they they have 
they'll say equip on them and you can equip them to survivors and when you do that you'll place that item card next to the survivor that has it equipped um, when you're adding a card uh, to the crisis again i said you can add one or more cards you can add cards from your hand or if uh, some equipment that a player is equipped with could be contributed to the crisis and you wanted to do that you can take an equipped card and also contribute that to the crisis okay you can see another thing you can do is move a survivor um, you can move each survivor you control once per round and you can move it from one location to any other location so from the colony to any of those locations or from one of those locations to another location as long as there's an empty spot for that survivor to go to but whenever you move a survivor you have to roll for exposure so there's <laughs> there's a risk to moving I guess because it's so cold outside that's the same with attacking the zombies I guess you're exposing yourself to the weather um, which could get you you're exposing yourself to the zombies and the weather so that's why you could take a wound from the cold or get frostbitten from the cold or get bitten from a zombie um, and the same when you're moving you're exposing yourself to the the weather and and zombies so uh, again there's a risk to moving just like there is to attacking a zombie you got to roll the exposure die and again you can only move each survivor once per round you can't move the same survivor twice you can spend food tokens so I had shown earlier how you could um, you know spend food cards uh, to add food tokens to the food supply so when you're spending food tokens a player can remove a food token from the food supply and increase one of their uh, die um, unused dies by one so you could move the two to the three or a four to a five you could spend another food token and you know move move it then up one more if you wanted to but spending food tokens is not <laughs> all that good because in the colony phase you're going to have to have a number of food tokens in the supply depending on the number of uh, survivors and helpless survivors that are in the colony which we'll talk about later all right the next action you can do is a request so a player can request an item card from other players um, if another player does give them that item card they have to reveal it immediately to everyone show what it is and play it immediately so you know if you requested a weapon or whatever or a food um, and a player gave it to you you'd have to immediately play that food and uh, take the food supply uh, item card that you request cannot be added to the crisis and if you make a request you know a player none of the other players have to give you that item it's just you're requesting it and you know someone may or may not give it to you but a player has to give you an item from their hand to be added to your hand and played immediately they can't uh, give you an item um, that's equipped uh, to one of their survivors that's where the next uh, action comes in and that's the handoff so for a handoff a player has to have a survivor he controls in a location hand off an item that that survivor has equipped to another survivor in that location and when that happens uh, you know he unequips that item and gives it to another survivor in that location and that survivor must immediately equip that item if that item that's handed off has a once per round ability and that ability had already been used that round then the player that it's the survivor that it's handed off to cannot use that ability that round and finally the last action that doesn't require an action dice is the vote to exile so when you vote to exile or once <clears throat> once during a player's turn um, a player can choose to initiate a vote to exile a survivor or not a survivor but a player 
So when you uh, call a vote uh, to <laughs> to initiate a vote to exile somebody, and you may want to do that if you think uh, a player is a betrayer, you may want to vote to exile them, or maybe the betrayer wants to vote to exile somebody else to maybe throw suspicion on them or something. But in any case, once per turn, um, you can initiate a vote to exile a player. And when you do that, all the players can, you know, talk about it first and, you know, discuss. But once you're ready to vote, you count down from three, three, two, one, and then everybody simultaneously either does a thumbs up or thumbs down. And uh, ties are broken by the first player. If the vote is successful to exile a player, then that player will immediately draw an exiled um, secret objective card, and that will replace their current secret objective card, and they'll now uh, use this uh, exiled objective card. The exiled player then has to move all of his survivors to non-colony locations and uh, you know where there's a space available and moving in this way they still have to roll for uh, um, exposure when they move them uh, to non-colony locations and uh, but it doesn't count uh, for the one movement around um, for their turn when they're moving them like that and then new rules apply to the exiled player. They can't add any cards to the crisis on their turn. If they get uh, some direction or, or card or something that tells them to add helpless survivors to the colony, they do not do that. If they get a survivor item card where they have to draw a new survivor, um, that survivor does not go to the colony as usual. It will have to go to um, some other location. The exiled uh, player cannot use the food supply of the colony, so they can't spend the food tokens to increase you know, a die result by one like we uh, talked about earlier. But they can, if they had food cards in their hand, they can spend those food cards to increase their die results. And when they play cards or spend a food card like I was just talking about, their cards do not go into the colony waste pile. They just go out of the game. The exiled player cannot participate in any future votes um, by the colony. And um, if one of the exiled player's survivors is killed, the colony does not lose a morale. We hadn't spoken about that yet, but normally each time a survivor is killed, the colony loses a morale, but again, if you're an exiled player and one of your survivors is killed, um, the colony does not lose a morale. If ever two players are exiled and neither one of them had the betrayal uh, secret objective, so two normal players, non-betrayer uh, players got exiled, then morale immediately drops to zero for the colony and that's one of the game end conditions. All right, so that is voting to exile and a little bit about what being exiled means. So that's all the actions you can take. So as we were discussing um, on a player's turn, they can take as many uh, actions as they want to and are able to with their dice or not actions that don't require dice. Um, once they've taken all their actions, it goes to the next player. Once all the players have taken their action, that ends the round and we go to the colony phase. So the first thing in the colony phase is you have to pay food, which I made a little reference to earlier when we were talking about spending food from the supply. So when you're paying food, you have to pay one food token for every two survivors in the colony, round it up. So, you know, in this case, we had uh, six survivors. We would have to play, uh, pay three food tokens. And that in ca uh, also counts um, helpless survivors. If helpless survivors get added to the colony, um, they count when you're counting for uh, 
how much food you have to spend. Again, it's one token for every two survivors, and that includes helpless survivors in the colony. If you don't have enough food tokens where you can pay that, then you just don't spend any of the food tokens, but you add one starvation token to the food supply, and then you lose one morale for every starvation token that's in the food supply at that time. Next, you check waste, which I kind of talked about earlier. For every 10 cards uh, in the waste pile, you lose one morale. And that's rounded down. So if you had 15 cards in the waste pile, uh, you know, you'd still just lose one morale. But if you had 20 cards in the waste pile, you'd lose two morale. So again, that's a reason you'll want to do the clean waste action occasionally. Next, you'll resolve the crisis. So you will remember you'll have some, hopefully, have some uh, cards face down in the crisis contribution pile. You'll then shuffle those and reveal them one at a time. For everyone that does have the symbol matching the current crisis, you add one point. For every card in there that doesn't have the symbol, like maybe the betrayer might put in there that has a different symbol, you subtract one point. If your total is equal to the number of non-exiled players, then you uh, don't have to do the fail portion of the crisis. If, you're, if your total is less than, then you do have to do whatever it says on the failed portion of the crisis. And again, if your total is at least two more than the number required, then you get to gain one morale or you know whatever it says here in the optional. Um, so then if once you've resolved the crisis, you just discard this crisis card because a new one will be coming up at the beginning of the next round. Next, you'll add zombies. So you'll add one zombie to the colony for every uh, two survivors there. So again, we have six survivors at the colony. We would add uh, three zombies. So when you're adding zombies to the colony, colony you start at entrance one and put one there. Then go to entrance two if you're putting another one. And then if you're putting a third one, you go to entrance three. And so on, you would go around if you were adding more, four, five, six. If you had to add a seventh one, you would then start over and put it in an empty space on entrance one again. If you ever had to add a zombie to a location like this, like you had to add another zombie to entrance one, there's not an empty space, but there is a barricade, then you remove the barricade, but you don't place the zombie there. So that zombie just will not get placed um, this time, but you do have to remove the barricade. If you had to place a zombie at a location and it's already full of zombies, there's not a barricade, then you don't place that new zombie, but you kill one survivor in the colony, the one with the lowest influence value. If there were only helpless survivor tokens in the colony and not any of the uh, standee survivors, then at that point you would kill a helpless uh, survivor, but otherwise you kill a standing survivor um, that has the lowest influence value. And remember that every time a survivor is killed, you decrease morale by one. And that even includes the helpless survivors. And when adding zombies to uh, non-colony locations, it works the same way, only there's uh, not six entrances like there is at the colony. There's just the one entrance. So um, if there was a, a barricade and you had to place a new one, then you'd just not place it, but you'd remove the barricade. Or if all three of these spaces were full and you had to place a new one, um, you would not place it, but if there was a survivor in that location, you would kill that survivor. Or if there was more than one survivor, you'd kill the one that was had the lowest influence value. So I went into a little detail about adding zombies, but, but back to the add zombies in the colony phase. Again, you add one to the colony for every two survivors, including helpless survivors in the colony. And then you add one zombie to each location 
for every survivor uh, in that location. So if there was one survivor in a location, you would add one zombie. If there's two survivors in a location, you would add two. If there's no survivors in there, you wouldn't add any. But then you have to resolve your noise tokens. For every noise token at a location, you roll a die, just a regular six-sided die. And if the result is three or lower, then you add a zombie to that location. And you do that for each noise token that's at the location. All right, the next thing you do is check the main objective, which remember is up here. In this case, the main objective is to have nine zombie tokens on here. And again, for every zombie that's killed, like if you attack a zombie, then you would roll a die. And if the result is four or higher, you would put a token on there. So you check the main objective. If there was at least nine tokens on here, then the main objective is complete. And that immediately uh, ends the game. If the main objective is not complete, then you go on to the next step, which is move the round tracker down. So you would move the round tracker down. Again, once it gets to zero, that will immediately end the game. Um, and then finally, you pass the first player token to the next player on the left. Then you'd start over uh, with a new player phase. Start with, uh, you know, reveal a crisis. So the game can end in several ways. If the morale reaches zero, then that just ends the game. As I said, if the round track zero reaches zero, then the game immediately ends. Or if the main objective is completed, then the game immediately ends. And whenever ends the game, uh, then players check their secret objective or exiled objective. Um, and if they've uh, completed uh, all the steps on there, then they win. If they've not, they lost. Again, there may be multiple winners or no winners. I think that pretty much covers uh, most of the rules. So I think I'll reset everything to how we were right after initial setup. And everybody had their survivors chosen and everything. I think we're almost at that point anyway. Um, and then we'll go through a few example turns. All right, I think we're going to just pick up um, right after the uh, roll action dice phase, you know, because we did that in my rules overview. We did the reveal crisis, which is this illness, and we had set up um, the morale and round track at six and added one zombie to each non colony location. We had rolled our action dice. So now we start with our player turns and we start with the first, uh, the player that has this token, who is the first player. So we'll look at his hand of cards. Um, we know he, he's not a betrayer, so he probably wants to help meet the crisis. So he has, he has a card that's a medicine. Um, he's going to go ahead and contribute to the crisis. He could contribute another one, but he's hoping other players will contribute. He's going to keep that one in case he gets a wound or something. He might need that. Um, Annalie Chan has a power at the colony, which that's where she's at, where she can once per round look at a um, card at random in a player's hand. So we'll just say she wants to look at this player's hand. She's going to pick a card at random and look at it. Oh, it's a food. Okay, so now she knows he's got a food in his hand. Nothing too helpful. I think this player will play a uh, food card into the waste pile to add a food token into the food supply. And we know to meet our main goal, we need to kill some zombies so we can roll a die and hopefully get a four or higher and get uh, some tokens on this card. So... I will say old, uh, this player is going to decide Brian Lee is going to move. So he's going to move Brian Lee to the police station because he's going to search for a weapon, I think. But because he moved, he's got a roll for um, exposure, but he got a blank, so that's good. All right, so now he's at the police station. He's going to, first he's going to attack a zombie, so... His attack value is 3, so he just has to play one of 3 or higher. So he's going to play this 4. 
So he attacks this zombie, he automatically, you know, that just automatically kills it. Now he's got to roll for exposure because he attacked a zombie. Oh, he got a wound. Alright, so he takes a wound, puts that on Brian Lee. Alright, but now because we uh, killed a zombie, every time a zombie is killed, roll a die on a uh, four or better, put a token on the card. Good, five. So we'll take a zombie token and put it on the card. So that's one. Eight more to go. All right. I think he's going to do a search now. He needs a dice with four or better. This one is a six. So Brian Lee is going to search this location. He got some night vision goggles. Which at the beginning of each round, you roll one additional action die. Equip. He's going to go ahead and equip that to uh, Brian Lee. So he's just going to put that underneath him there. Oh, you know what I totally forgot? First thing we had to do is the player to this player's right should have drawn, drawn a cut crossroads card. That's important not to forget. So this one is if the player controls a survivor at the colony and there are two or more helpless survivors at the colony. Okay. Well, it wouldn't have triggered because currently there's no helpless survivors. Now, if during Brian's turn or during this player's turn, uh, some helpless, two or more helpless survivors get uh, added to the colony, then it'll trigger because he still has a survivor, Anna Lee Chan, at the colony. So we'll see. This player will hold on to that. All right, so he's got that equipped. We've got one more die, but it's only at two. Um, not really anything good. I guess uh, we could put a barricade. He could he could uh, use that to place a barricade um, where he has a survivor, so he could do it here or at the colony. I guess uh, he'll add one to the colony. All right, so this player is going to say they're done. So now play passes to the player to their left. This crossroads card never got triggered, so it just gets discarded. Now the player to this player's right draws a crossroad card before this player starts their turn. If the survivor, if a survivor the player controls is at the colony, well, both the survivors the player this player controls are at the colony. So it says, so this triggers immediately. Morale, <clears throat> morale around this place is at an all-time low. I know fuel scarce, scarce, but imagine what hot showers and meals could do for everybody. Get us feeling human again. Sometimes I think we focus so much on obvious necessities that we forget about the emotional ones, you know? So the player has this option. Player may collectively, players may collectively place three fuel cards in the waste pile without using their ability to raise morale by not by one. If not, nothing happens. Um, I think none of the players say they want to do that, so we'll just go ahead and discard this. All right, so this player, they decide they want to contribute to the crisis, so they look through their cards, and they have, they have a medicine, so of course they put that face down. The other players don't know what they played, so they don't know if they're putting something good or not. And they're also going to play this food and add uh, food to the food supply. They have another food. They're going to play that and add another food to the food supply. All right. Then uh, they're going to use Ashley Ross's ability. Once per round, you may perform a barricade action without using an action die. So she's going to put a barricade uh, here at space two in the colony. Then I think Ashley's going to move, so Ashley's going to move to the, where is she? She is going to move, because she wants to get weapons. Um, for her to win, she has to have at least two uh, weapon cards equipped. So she's going to move to the police station also, because we know that's a good place to get weapons. So she's going to move there. Now she would have to roll for exposure when you move, but she's going to spend this fuel card Play this card when moving a survivor you control. Do not roll for exposure that move. So that goes into the waste pile. She doesn't have to roll for exposure for moving. So now she's there. 
she's going to search. Now her search, she needs a 5 plus, which she's only got one uh, that has that, but now she's allowed to search. Oh, she only got a fuel. You know what? She decides she's going to make noise, so she's going to make noise. She gets to draw an, draw an additional card. Uh, she could make noise again. I think she's going to make noise again and draw an additional card. Oh, no weapon. All right. She'll keep the fuel and discard these two food to the bottom of the search pile. That didn't work out too well. All right. Um, the doctor is still at the colony, so she's going to clean waste. She's going to spend a die. Um, can be any value to clean waste, so discard the three top cards from the waste pile, and those just go out of the game. All right, uh, what else could we do? It'd be good to attack a zombie, but there isn't uh, any in the location where Ashley is at, nor where uh, Olivia is at. Um, so we could do an attract action. Uh, I have uh, somebody do an attract action, but that costs a dice, and then we wouldn't have a dice to do an attack. But then maybe the next player will be able to do an attack. So that's what we're going to do. For an attract, we can use a dice of any value. And we'll have Olivia do an attract so she can move two zombies from any location to an entrance location where she's at. So she's at the colony. So we'll have her move one from the grocery store and one from the school um, to her location. And I think that's going to wrap up her turn. So we come over here to this player. So the person to her right uh, will draw the uh, crossroads card. And it says if the player um, controls Carla and she is not exiled. This player does not control Carla. So we'll hold on to that in case she does end up uh, controlling a Carla before the end of the turn. Now this player, for them to win, of course the main objective has to be completed and then they have the most survivors in their following. So they're going to want to find other survivors. Um, but we know there's some zombies here that we probably need to kill. So let's see. We'll have uh, David. He's here at the... Both David and uh, Janet are here at the colony. So David's going to spend it. Cost him a 4 plus to do an attack. So he's going to spend a 5 to do an attack. That's going to kill a zombie. So we just get rid of it. Now he's got to roll for exposure. Oh, and he got a wound. So we will put a wound token on him. But now we're going to do for our... Uh, um, roll our die to see if we add a token um, to our card there. And we do. So we add another zombie token to our objective. Remember, playing with three players, we got to get a total of nine uh, zombie tokens on there to complete our main objective. All right, why don't we go and have go ahead and have uh, Janet make an attack on that other zombie that's here at the colony. She can make an attack with a three plus, so she'll use this five. So she's going to kill this zombie. Now she'll have to roll for exposure. Blank, that's good, no wound. And now we roll to see if we put a token. Remember, we need a four plus. Ah, oh, no token. Oh well. All right, I think we'll add some food to the colony. Uh, this player has a few foods, food cards, three. So she's going to spend three food cards to add three food tokens to the colony. And then uh, she has a medicine, um, so she's going to... Uh, Add a card to the crisis. Put that face down. Nobody knows what she really put there. All right. Uh, we still have a two left. Uh, that doesn't really help us too much. Um, well, we'll just say they're going to spend that to put a uh, 
barricade another barricade at the colony and we'll put it here and then I think we'll go ahead and have you know Janet has this uh, once per round when performing a search at the hospital now she doesn't have any more dice so she won't be able to perform a search this round but we'll go ahead and move her to the hospital so uh, Janet's gonna move to the hospital and now she's got a roll for exposure for moving and unfortunately she did get a wound so we will put that on her and I think that is pretty much um, all she is going to do this round so we're going to end her turn which is going to end the ra end the round in the player turn step of the player turns phase so now we'll go to the colony phase all right so the first thing in the colony is pay food we gotta pay one food token for every two survivors in the colony rounded up now survivors in locations outside the colony don't count they're scavenging their own food so we've only got three uh, survivors in the colony so uh, one for every two rounded up that's going to mean we got to uh, spend two food tokens so we'll just put those back in the supply all right next thing we do is check waste make sure we don't have at least 10 cards in there we don't we've only got four so nothing to do there all right next thing we do is resolve the crisis so we pick up these cards and shuffle them so we don't know what player put what in there then we look at them all right so that's one point because that matches what we need two points because that matches what we need and three points that matches what we need so we didn't get any cards that don't have the the correct icon to subtract from our total so our total of three does equal our number of non-exiled uh, players so we don't fail the crisis we don't get the bonus because we would have needed five cards to do that but at least we don't fail the crisis then these cards that were added to the crisis are just uh, out of the game and we discard this crisis card it doesn't really say that in the rule I couldn't find where it said to do with the, what the uh, old crisis card but I'm assuming you discard it so I'm just gonna throw that up there alright the next thing we do is add zombies so we add a zombie to the colony for every two survivors uh, round it up so we're gonna add two zombies to the to the uh, colony and we put the first one in entrance one and the second one in entrance two so that's not that too bad then we add one zombie to every non-colony location where there uh, one zombie for every survivor there so we'll actually add two zombies uh, here at the police station since we've got two survivors there so we will add two there um, the only other place we have a survivor is at the hospital, so we will add one zombie there. But now we do have these no noise tokens here at the police station to contend with. So we'll remove this first noise token, and then we got to roll a d6, and on a roll of three or lower, we got to add a zombie. Oh, we got to add one. So we will add this one, and then we have one more noise token there. So we got to roll again on a three or lower. All right, we don't have to add one for that. And we don't have any other noise tokens. So that's all we have to do for the add zombies. So next we check the main objective. We know we need nine tokens. We only have two, so we have not completed the main objective yet. Uh, we move the round marker down one. And finally we pass the first player token to the left. So this player will become the first player for the new round and we would start over a new round now by revealing the next crisis and go on like we just did until either the rounds get to zero or we meet the main objective or morale gets to zero and then uh, you know if you complete the main objective and you've done one of your other whatever else on your um, secret objective then you may or may not have won the game 
So I think I'll wrap it up there. This video has gone on, you know, pretty long. I didn't have a chance to show all the actions, but really, when you're playing solo, the vote to exile and, and request, um, you know, some of those actions I didn't see or, you know, kind of difficult to do. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I think this game came out in 2014, if I remember right. It was really popular for several years i don't know it may still be popular i know there's been some expansions i don't have them in fact i only played this i think i got it not long after it came out but i didn't play it uh until 2018 and again I, that was me playing it by myself i have not yet played this um with other people i did play it uh yesterday again solo just so i could uh, refresh myself on the rules to do this video but um, I, I think I would enjoy playing it with other people. Um, I think it, it, that's where it would shine, you know, playing it. It's not really made to be played solo. Um, but even though, even though it's not made to be played solo, I do kind of enjoy it. Um, the, the couple of times I've played it, I enjoyed playing it solo, but it would be a lot more fun with other players because you don't know if somebody's a betrayer or not and uh, that kind of thing so uh i enjoy it uh at least uh, the couple of times i've played it i enjoyed it good you know horror halloweeny theme game so that's why i did it here in october uh, i think that's it uh, thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed it